Good afternoon. I'm Jacob Bohofsky. I work at Washington University in St. Louis, and I'm here to, to provide guidelines of timing of surgery and radiation therapy, as well as surgery selection in patients with metastatic spine disease. Here are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to this talk. We're talking about metastatic spine disease because cancer is very common and is the number one or number two cause of mortality in the United States. In addition to which, spinal metastases cause considerable morbidity and their early recognition is important in reducing pain, improving or preserving neurologic function and maximizing quality of life. There are various treatment options when we see a patient with metastatic spine disease, ranging from systemic therapy to surgical treatment. Optimal therapy is dependent on tumor histology, performance status, tumor burden, and neurologic status. We operate on patients with metastatic spine disease primarily when they present with neurologic compression or when they present with spinal instability or pathologic fracture, but sometimes we will operate on patients who present with unrelenting pain secondary to mechanical instability or when there is a need to establish a histologic diagnosis. Why do we operate on patients with metastatic spine disease? The answer to this is that it seems to work. From various studies, we know that patients treated with surgery followed by radiation therapy tend to do better than patients who are treated with radiation therapy alone when they present with metastatic epidural spinal cord compression. This was first demonstrated in the Patchell study that we're all familiar with, which showed that patients treated with surgery retained their ability to walk significantly longer and more patients treated with surgery regained their ability to walk compared to patients treated with radiation therapy alone. In addition to which the Patchell study showed that some of the other secondary endpoints favored surgery. One of the interesting observations from the Batchel study is that patients treated with radiotherapy who crossed over to the surgical treatment arm thereafter had inferior clinical outcomes, suggesting that if surgery is considered, it is best employed prior to radiotherapy treatment. The decision as to when to operate on patients with metastatic spine disease is complex. The GNOMES framework, as well as an algorithm from the Mayo Clinic that I will share, help to guide our decision-making process. The GNOMES framework was popularized by Mark Bilski and colleagues and takes into consideration neurologic, oncologic, mechanical, and systemic considerations. It also incorporates the use of radiation therapy, stereotactic radiosurgery, and surgery. Based on whether a patient has a low-grade or high-grade epidural spinal cord compression, whether they have a radioresistant or radiosensitive tumor, whether they have mechanical instability or not, and systemic factors, helps to guide the decision as to what kind of treatment would be ideally rendered. The Mayo Clinic framework takes into consideration similar factors and helps to guide our treatment option as is seen in this flowchart here. How do we determine if a patient with metastatic disease has spinal instability? This is an important question as the presence of spinal instability is used both in the GNOMES framework as well as in the Mayo Clinic algorithm. The best way to determine whether the patient has spinal instability in my mind is to use the spinal instability neoplastic score. This score takes into consideration the location of the spine lesion whether there's pain present, the bone quality, radiographic alignment, vertebral body collapse, and posterolateral involvement. And based on these factors, helps us to determine whether the patient has spinal instability or not. There are other ways to think about spinal instability. One, popularized by my mentor, John Kostowick, takes into consideration the anterior, middle, and posterior columns of the spine and if a significant number of these columns is involved, that means that the patient has impending spinal instability. There are other potential algorithms that can be used to determine whether the patient is at risk for developing spinal instability, as is shown here. Tanechi, for example, used CT criteria to determine if the patient was at risk for vertebral body collapse, both in the thoracic as well as the thoracolumbar and lumbar spine.
when should we be operating on patients who present with metastatic epidural spinal cord compression? The answer to that is, again, complex, but I recently concluded systemic review helps to guide our treatment. What we know is that the duration of time between the onset of neurologic deficit and surgery adversely affects the probability of neurologic improvement. For example, patients treated within 48 hours of the onset of symptoms tend to do better than patients treated greater than 48 hours after the onset of symptoms in multiple studies. Similarly, patients treated within three days or even 10 days tend to do better than those treated more than 15 days after the onset of symptoms. Patients treated more than 48 hours after the onset of symptoms may possibly be at risk of neurologic deterioration. Based on the systemic review, we also know that there is a strong association between the severity of preoperative neurologic deficit and postoperative neurologic recovery. Furthermore, there are some radiographic factors that may play a role as well. For example, patients with vertebral compression fractures are possibly less likely to regain ambulatory status, and patients with thoracic compression may possibly be well may, may possibly be less likely to regain ambulatory status compared to patients with cervical or lumbar compression. Not surprisingly, oncologic factors play a role as well. The next question is, how should we determine the optimum timing between surgery and radiation therapy? There are no terrific studies that answer this question, but a recently conducted systemic review of 41 articles suggests that an interval of two weeks is optimum between radiation therapy and surgery or vice versa. There is a possibility that this could potentially be reduced by using postoperative stereotactic radiosurgery. Another surgery shows similar findings and suggests that the interval between radiotherapy and surgery and vice versa should again be a minimum of two weeks. How do we put all this together? When I see a patient who presents with an asymptomatic lesion or pain only without extra osseous disease extension or risk of impending fracture, I tend to suggest local disease control with systemic treatment or radiation therapy. I will sometimes use bracing or cement augmentation depending on the degree of pain. I then follow those patients closely because surgery may sometimes be needed. Patients who present with radiosensitive symptomatic lesion with compression of neural elements or impending or completed fracture are again typically treated with radiation therapy. Bracing and cement augmentation may sometimes be needed and in rare circumstances surgery may become necessary. Examples of this would include patients with multiple myeloma, lymphoma, and so on. Patients who present with radioresistant symptomatic lesions are typically treated with surgery followed by radiation therapy. Examples here include renal cell carcinoma and non-small cell lung cancer. Exceptions include patients who have an expected survival of less than three months and those unable to tolerate surgery. Here's a case example, a 62-year-old male who presented with a two-week history of increasing neck pain in the setting of previous renal cell carcinoma and prostate cancer. As you can see on the plain radiographs, MRI scan and CT scan, this patient has a pathologic fracture at the cervical thoracic junction with involvement of the posterior elements. This patient was treated with surgery followed by radiation therapy given the inherent instability of this fracture. In conclusion, the prevalence of metastatic spine disease is likely to increase over time. Appropriate management of metastatic spine disease is critical the GNOMES framework and other algorithms can help steer the decision-making process when we see a patient with metastatic spine disease. SINs and other classification systems can be helpful in determining the presence of spinal instability, which is critical as the presence of spinal instability is usually one of the main indications for surgery. In patients with a neurologic deficit, efforts should be made to expedite surgery to increase the likelihood of improvement and to prevent further neurologic deterioration.
an interval of at least two weeks between surgery and radiation therapy seems to be optimal. Thank you very much.